Hi, everyone. Um, we welcome you here today. Um, we're here with Keith Joseph Atkins. He is a uh, researcher of uh, Charity Southgate. And I think, you know, if you're from Pendleton County, you've probably heard the name. Uh, she was wrongly enslaved here in the 1800s, and she sued for her freedom and eventually got it. Uh, Keith is going to talk more about that, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about him first. Um, Keith is joining us from Los Angeles. He is a screenwriter and a playwright. Um, as I've already said, a, a, an African-American researcher, uh, particularly his, his roots. Um, and he has a little bit of experience, more than a little bit, but I'll, I'll say a little bit of experience, um, writing blogs. If you've ever heard of The Root, uh, if you've not Google it, it's probably still out there. He used to write uh, for Henry Louis Gates, and I think we all know who he, that is uh, because we all watch that show, don't we? Uh, it's good to have you with us, Keith. It's great to be here. Great to be yeah. here. Definitely. <laughs> I should uh, tell everyone that Keith is, um, I first met Keith about oh, getting close to a couple of years ago. We sat on a round table discussing charity together. Um, and so I'm really, really delighted. That's one of the, one of the upsides of uh, quarantine and um, having to do virtual programming is that we get to have these people that, that we normally would not get to have and do right, programs. Yeah. So we are really excited right. that you're here. How long have you been uh, doing your African-American research? Um, I would say I started probably 25 years ago. Um, and I was very young. I was like the youngest person at the Mormon Genealogical Library where I started doing research. And everyone was looking at me like, is he an intern? Is he, <laughs> is he a volunteer? It's like, no, I'm here for really trying to find out who I am, you know? Um, but yeah, it's been like 25 years ago. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So what got you into it? What made you decide well, you wanted to, to go on this journey? Well, um, you know, I was one of those people who had a grandfather who talked a great deal about his genealogy and ancestry um, without calling it that. He just sort of talked about his grandfather and his great grandfather. And one of the stories that I remembered about his great grandfather was that he had been an enslaved man uh, from Galveston, born in Galveston, Texas, um, born um, of a black enslaved woman and a white um, overseer. Um, and that his role or sort of his duty as, um, as an enslaved person was to sleep at the foot of his father's bed to keep his father's feet warm. Uh, and that was sort of like the story that we were told and I, and I remember in particular, actually it wasn't my grandfather's great grandfather, it was his grandfather who was okay. this enslaved uh, man named Calvin Elder. And so, um, so as I got older, and then my grandfather talked a great deal about um, other people on that from that line of Calvin. Mm -hmm. And then um, my grandfather, at one point, he worked. For, he was an engineer for the University of Cincinnati and retired. Um, and then he, and my grandmother, moved to Florida, which is where his father was born, um, to in Pensacola, Florida. And when I went to visit one summer, he took me to the cemetery um, where the family was buried. And still, I was like. A, very early teen, like maybe 12 years old. Um, but he took me to the great, the cemetery. It was the Naval Reservation Cemetery um, and they were buried there. And so I saw Calvin Cemetery, the, the, um, mm -hmm. his, great, his, um, his grandfather, um, the grandfather's two wives and other family members. So all the names that he had talked about, I saw those ancestors. Sure. Um, and so um, when I was living in Oakland, California, years and years ago, right when I came um, out of undergrad, um, my, um, a friend of mine suggested, cause I talked about history a lot and they suggested for me to go to the Mormon genealogical library because they had all this information. I was like, oh, cool. And so I went there and what I was looking for was just information on Calvin Elder. Like, that was my, my whole objective. Right. And I went there and I was, I was just amazed at all the information. And then I said, well, why I'm here, well, let me kind of look at my grandmother's family and my grandmother's family originate in Pillenden County. Um, okay. And so I just knew that their, the last names were Ayers and Wilsons and Southgates, but I didn't know what any of that ultimately meant. I didn't know what the, the legacy of all that was. Um, and so initially in that first day, I think I went to an index for the Daughters of the American Revolution and they mentioned um, some heirs and like my grandmother's aunts and stuff like that were mentioned because they were school teachers. And then they mentioned something about Charity Southgate. I was like, Charity Southgate, who's that? 
Um, and so that took me on the journey of charity. And then I start putting all these things together. Um, and certain cousins of mine who are actually Southgates, that's their last name. They were like, yeah, charity Southgates are da 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 da. I was like, what? How did I not know this? <laughs> so that that was like the initial um, <laughs> venture into uh, the world of charity Southgate and, and my own family history, yeah. Mm -hmm. So if someone is, and we're gonna talk about charity a little later on, but if somebody's wanting to get into their um, history, family history, it's fairly easy to track your black history back to 1870, 1880. But once you start getting into enslaved people, what do you do? How, how do they go to that point? You know, how do they get past that? Right, yeah, well, I, um, you know, I would say initially, you know, use great resources like Ancestry.com or um, the National ICARV database, archives database, which I think some of that information is online, but you can also go once, mm -hmm. you know, once the pandemic sort of quiets down, you can actually go to those institutions um, and there's information there, right, for whoever you're looking for. Um, but um, the important thing to know is like, once you try to go beyond 1870, it's important to um, sort of well, I'll say this. So in 1870, um, if you have the names of any of your ancestors, your black ancestors, they were most likely enslaved prior to 1865. And so the, the good thing to do is to look for slave owners that, that share the same surname in the area that your family has been enslaved in and, lived, and lives in, right? Or lived in. And if you can identify that slave owner or at least a family of slave owners, then you can start looking through records like deeds and appraisements and, um, and um, uh, other sort of property, you know, appraisements and all those kind of um, documents that you can find that I found recently on familysearch.org. Um, they have, you can go through this to a state and they'll give you um, like a little uh, index of like appraisements and da 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 based on the county, right? So if you know your slave owner's last name and you know the county, you can just start looking through some of these databases, um, uh, again, appraisements and, and properties and wills and books of wills and deeds and all those things and look for the slave owner's name. And often you'll be able to find records of um, where they had to list property and their mm -hmm. enslaved laborers. Um, and then often the names of the persons are there and often those names will be um, identifiable to your 1870 census. Cause you'll see like if there was a woman, say for example, Mahalia, you know, um, uh, Blankson or whatever, right? Um, and if you see in 1860, the slave owner Blankson had a slave named Mahalia and then it may mention her children. It just sort of opens the door but it requires some really diligent digging and looking. It's not as easy as it is. To, a lot of patients. Um, sometimes it'll take a day just to find one document. Um, the great thing too now is that Ancestry.com, and I'm not here to sort of promote them in any way, but um, it's been really great because they have added so many new resources to their databases. Um, and so it's easier to, things pop up for you to point you in the right direction. But I do think that um, FamilySearch.org <laughs> is much more reliable definitely um, much more reliable um, uh, website that has specifically like this is Georgia, like Talaferro County, Georgia's property owners, wills and deeds, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's great to see those wills. Um, sure. I had a really amazing discovery, um, not on my mother's side, which is the charity side, but my father's mm -hmm. side, which um, his family's from Georgia, um, East Central Georgia. And, um, and my great great grandfather, his name was Henry Clay Atkins. Um, we always assumed that his father was white and his mother had been enslaved because we knew that he was at least biracial or mixed race looking and, um, and found out that his father was another man of color um, who was born from a white woman, much like this charity story um, in Georgia, which was almost extremely impossible to believe that was happening. Um, right. But more, but more interesting, <laughs> we didn't know who, who the mother was, like who Henry Clay's mother was. And, and then through Ancestry, they have this new um, through line sort of uh, feature, right? Where you can like people's uh, DNA is matched up with yours and tracks sort of like how you are connected through your tree. And so um, these, 
this family that whose last name was one, a win, W-Y-N-N-E, kept popping up as um, DNA matches for my dad and I. And these are white wins. And I was like, well, what are the white wins? Whatever. So anyway, long story much shorter, um, I found the will indeed of a Clement win. And in the will, he mentions um, that he wants his slave girl, Sally, to go to his niece, Frances Atkins, who was, who was where, Frances Atkins was married to the son of the plantation owner that Henry Clay worked at, where he was born. And I was like, oh, that's Henry's mother, because that explains why I'm connected to the winds, because his mother was the wind, Sally Wynn. So anyway, long story, um, much, much shorter, just to say yeah. how those, yeah. Right. Yeah, the resources. A lot of cool really things out there now, especially with DNA and yeah, absolutely. And more records going online. It's a lot easier absolutely. probably than when you started. Oh my way. God! Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay, so tell us about charity. Oh, charity! <laughs> yeah, okay, a dynamic so, story. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, very dynamic story. Um, you know, um, I remember uh, my grandmother, and I just want to give you this little bit of preamble. So my grandmother. Um, there was like a centennial or bicentennial celebration in Northern Kentucky. I don't remember when that was. It may have been in the 70s or 80s, um, but I know I was young and they mentioned the Southgate family as being one of these kind of pioneering families of the area, um, black pioneering families. And that's when I got more information about like, chair, like you know, like, uh, well, I think that's when I initially heard the Southgate thing and didn't connect it to charity. So later on, um, after my uh, visit to the Mormon Genealogical Library, I found that uh, uh, I think it was a newspaper article that was written either by Cincinnati Post uh, person or, or someone in Cincinnati about charity. She was mentioned this guy named John Singer in Charity Southgate. And I saw that information. I was like, oh, wow, let me find out more about this. Um, and that's when I kind of just went in, you know, <laughs> just like, oh, this is juicy. Um, so what I understand to be true, um, and I think there's more kind of like documents coming out to support um, and kind of like, you know, broaden her story, but she was born in Loudoun County, Virginia. Um, and she was the daughter of a woman named Martha, who they call Patsy Palmer, um, who was living in uh, the adjacent Rockingham County, Virginia with her I think it was her half sister and her half sister's husband, Robert Foster. Um, and within Robert Foster's household, and I researched this, there were I think one or two um, enslaved, or I would just say it's uh, black people living in the household around the time Charity was born. So I'm assuming one of them was her father. I don't know if her father was enslaved, in fact, or if he was free and just working for the family. Um, I know that one of Charity's sons wasn't sure if Charity's father was African or Native American. He wasn't sure about it. Um, and, I, I, and I assume that's because she didn't know herself, right? Um, but what I do know um, and understand is that Charity was born and um, she lived with her mother, Patsy. Um, I'm assuming they stayed in Rockingham County, or perhaps not, I'm not sure. Maybe they went back to Loudoun County, um, but um, she, around the age of two, um, I think the story is that she started to sort of, it became obvious that she was a mixed race girl and it was impossible to hide that. And so the Palmer family, and I'm sure it wasn't her mother who was part of this, but her mother's father, perhaps, or uncles or brothers, um, basically passed charity off to friends of theirs, the Pullen family, who were living in Nelson County, Kentucky. Um, who originally were from the Loudoun County, Rockingham County area. And they were Methodist and, um, and, and Charity came to them as a very, a toddler and they allowed her to live as far as um, I understood as a free girl of color. Um, and so uh, not enslaved. Although I have read recently that, and I, maybe this is something that you found Fran, that uh, the Pullen family were actually benefiting from the fact that she was a woman of color and actually getting money, like, you know, <laughs> passing her off as enslaved, yeah. even though she wasn't legally enslaved. Right. Um, yeah, I ran across that in some, um, I didn't find the court document to um, back that up because a lot of the, her court case went missing, but someone had access to that court right. case and copied down ver pretty much verbatim what was in it. And yes, they were paying taxes on her, according to this. And right. um, 
had hired her right. out. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, right, right. Oh man, that's crazy. That's crazy. And you know, what's interesting too is yes. that you know what I understand is that once um, the um, I think it was Philip Palmer who came to um, Nelson County to sort of officially deliver her into slavery. Um, if I think of that's how the story goes. Um, and, um, but, but what's interesting is that she immediately had an attorney friend to help her fight her case that she was indeed a free woman of color because she knew that her, she knew her circumstance and her status because of her mother, even though she probably didn't remember her mother. Mm -hmm. um, and she clearly was lit. Yeah, it seemed like it was common knowledge among everybody. Asher right. Cohen knew it and- Right, right. yeah, mm -hmm. right, absolutely. And there were small little clusters of free families around. So it wasn't like a foreign thing, right? Um, it, it was rare, right. but it wasn't foreign. And so, but the fact that she had an attorney friend um, who was part of, uh, you know, I'm sure he was probably an abolitionist of some sort or, you know, part of that kind of culture. Um, but the fact that she had access to him told me that she had access to him prior to any of this happening. So that means to me that she did live in her mind as a free person and they kind of let her live that way. So even them hiring her out, I imagine that she probably got some money out of that those wages, sure. right? Because yeah. <laughs> um, she's yeah, yeah, she seemed very um, just according to the court documents um, and even her children's behavior, she seemed very like you know uh, empowered person, like sort of indestructible. Yes. Um, and so what I understand <laughs> is that you know she was sold into slavery, um, you know, put into several different households um, around Pendleton, Pendleton County, um, and then ultimately I think she worked for I think it was uh, was it John Hobday. Or Hobdy? Hobday. Yeah. That was um, wasn't he the person who enslaved Alan Hobday, her husband? Right, right. Um, but at one point, her name was also and under she, yeah. So she was in the household, or probably on the property, um, and then she purchased um, Alan from Alan. Yeah, from um, mm -hmm. the Hobday, the Hobday man. Right. Um, and so yeah, so that that part of the story that I know. And I know that she um, she and Alan, so she had children prior to marrying Alan. I know she had a son named um, Elsie Hughes by, uh, and I think it was, um, I can't think of the, it was an attorney whose last name was Hughes. I can't think of his first name right now. I want to say Andrew or- well, Andrew, she yeah. lived in Andrew's household. Okay. Right, right. She lived in yeah. Andrew's household, right. And so right. She, at, in that household, her son Elsie was born. Um, and that was Alan's son. And I think she had an older daughter named Lucy um, and I think Charlotte. And there was, an, I think, um, I wanna say Minerva. Min Minerva. Minerva. Minerva, right. And so I think those children were born prior to Alan and her's relationship and their marriage, okay. right? And so she brought those children into that marriage. But I think Lucy died young. And so Lucy also had a child um, um, whose name was Alan as well, Alan Southgate, who became Alan Southgate, um, who Charity raised, um, but he had been enslaved because he sort of got caught up in the, the court dynamic where, you know, right. <laughs> um, so ultimately, um, it's, you, know, as, you know, I don't wanna sort of go verbatim, verbatim as far as what happened with her, but I know that um, she ultimately um, got her freedom because a man in town who happened to be just passing through who was from her mother's um, hometown and area was asked to you know, uh, testify at um, the circuit court in beha on behalf of Charity as far as proving that she was indeed the daughter of a white woman because I believe that was the huge sort of hiccup in her, in her claim because no one, she could not you know, um, clearly confirm that or even sort of like solidify that. Um, and this guy apparently, and I'm telling the story the way I want to tell it, just kind of came through town on his way to California or wherever he was going and said, oh yeah, she looks just like her mother. You guys finish, I'm out of here. <laughs> um, but I think it was as simple as that. And, um, and from that, she was free. Like she was given her free status. And what I love about her story is that she spent many years um, going to the circuit court, um, trying to get that free status back officially. Um, and, uh, and that's really just impressive, you know? Um, and, tenacity. And, and tenacity yes. without a doubt. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. and, um, and so, yes, yeah, so she also took several years to get her children. Oh yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 She got her children too. The ones that had been enslaved prior to Alan, 
her and Alan's marriage. In fact, I imagine, and I'm not sure yet because I'm not looking at my documents in front of me, but I think there are a couple of children were born with she and Alan before Alan was freed. I think they were together and then finally, the, you know, she purchased him and then he's free, but the children were already, so a few of the older kids were already kind of in the world. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, but she was free by that time when the rest of her kids were born. And she had seven, several children. Um, uh, she lived in Falmouth. Um, she moved, I think she moved to an area that they ultimately called Sleepy Hollow, if I'm not happy mistaken. Hollow. Or happy, yeah. happy Hollow, thank happy you. Hollow. Happy yes. Hollow, right. Happy yeah. Hollow. And also I heard um, Little Egypt too. I think I heard the area was called Little Egypt. Where she there was, lived. There is an area called that, yes. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. And so um, I do know that she, um, she purchased a few lots of land there. Um, mm -hmm. I think she put her money behind the, the building of the first AME African Methodist Episcopal yes. Church, um, which I know for a fact that it is a um, institution that has served uh, as far as education for uh, enslaved and free black people and the Underground Railroad. Like they were really at, mm -hmm. active in the Underground Railroad. So it is pretty highly probable that, that charity was part of the underground room. Sure. Mm -hmm. Highly probable. Wouldn't you just um, love to find something to prove that? <laughs> I'm trying to find it. I'm trying to find it. Yes. Um, and, uh, but yes, yeah, so she had several children and her daughter, Lucinda Southgate, um, is my connection because um, Lucinda married uh, a Robert Ayers the first, who was from um, Cynthiana, Kentucky, um, Harrison County, you know, which is very close to Falmouth. Mm -hmm. um, and he was also from a free family of color. Right. right. He yeah, was, yeah. That, that's an interesting story, too. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because oh, absolutely. you go back to the Lynams, and Lynams were free even before Robert Ayers was free. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. The Lynams so were. Yeah. 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 Robert Ayers, the first, was the son of Susanna Lynam. And mm -hmm. Susanna Lynam was the daughter of Francis Lynam, who. Susanna being a free woman of color. Her mother was also free. I don't know her mother's name. Right. Uh, I'm working really hard trying to find that name, but I believe the last name was um, Bruin. Um, Cause I keep seeing these Bruins popping up in sort of family documents. Um, and I'm assuming it can't, it couldn't have been a lot of free families around. And if that's a family that's free, I imagine that she probably came from that family. Sure. Um, but Francis Lina was born in Stafford County, Virginia, and his mother, Rose Lina, born in 1725, was also a free woman of color from Stafford County, Virginia. Wow. So the family goes back that far. That far. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the heirs line goes back right now to um, Maryland. Um, and because uh, Robert's father, Leander Ayers, was born in Maryland in 1791. Um, and I think I now recently identified his sister who was living in um, Nicholas County, um, Kentucky, um, a woman named, um, uh, what was her name? Oh my God, I can't think of it right now. Uh, I wanna say Sarah Jones, Sarah Ayers Jones, but that's a whole nother conversation for a whole, whole, a whole nother time. Um, but Lucinda Southgate um, married Robert Ayers the first, but when he came from Cynthiana, um, he initially courted her sister, Polly Ann Southgate, um, and I'm not sure what happened there, but they did have a child. Um, and then soon after, uh, or perhaps while Polly was pregnant, uh, Robert and Lucinda got together and married. And then she had a child soon after Polly had a child. So um, I am a descendant of Lucinda's child with um, Robert. And I have another cousin who's a descendant. We always talk about the sisters fighting or whatever that was. Um, but I'm a descendant of... Uh, uh, Robert Ayers and Lucinda uh, Southgate and their, and their son, Robert Ayers Jr. And he married a woman named Betty Price, who was from Xenia, Ohio. Um, and they had a son named Leslie Ayers. And Leslie Ayers had my grandmother, Florence Ayers Elder, and my mother, Joan Elder, and me, Keith Atkins. So that's, that's my, um, my story with uh, my lineage of charity, yeah. And Be Betty Price was a teacher, I believe. She was a teacher, yes. Mm -hmm. Betty Price was a teacher. Um, she was born in Xenia, Ohio. It appears that she, her family were also free um, because that's sort of like the oral story mm -hmm. in the family. I haven't found any evidence of that, but I'm assuming that they were extremely poor and so they couldn't live as singular as, as a singular family. So I believe they were probably enumerated with a white family 
And that's why I can't find them in any documents. Um, but they were associated with other free families. Um, and so that Betty's parents had relatives who moved to New Richmond, Indiana, which was another cluster of free people, mm -hmm. uh, free people communities, and also the AME Church was very active there. And so, and then there was also Xenia, Ohio, that also had a similar kind of dynamic as New Richmond, New Richmond, right. Indiana. And so I know that Betty's mother had family in New Richmond and she had family in Xenia. So I made the connection that there was like this triangle of somewhere in Northern Kentucky, New Richmond, Indiana, and Xenia, Ohio. Like that was sort of like this free person cluster that Betty's family comes from, yes. Right. Yeah. And presumably that was, uh, that triangle was a little active maybe with the Underground Railroad. Didn't I hear that somewhere? Yes, definitely, definitely. There was a minister, um, his name was Liberty Ross, uh, Reverend Liberty Ross, who was initially from Kentucky. I think he was from Mason County, Kentucky, because Mason County is also one of those mm -hmm hot spots of clusters of uh, sure. free black life and underground railroad activity. But he was from there and he actually lived at one point with Betty's uh, uncle and aunt in New Richmond and next door to her grandparents. Um, so I was like, oh, there has to be a connection there. Like there's some connection, but he was really active on the underground railroad and very outspoken and um, a pretty big figure in the AME church at that time in like the 18, 40s and 50s. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Right. Wow. Okay. Anything else you want to share with us today? Because this has been uh, a really cool story. <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> I'm, happy. I'm happy it's entertaining. Um, I'm trying to think there's so many things to share, right? Um, sure. You know, I think, I think, you know, for me, um, as more information, you know, is um, exposed about Charity and her journey and sort of her life in Kentucky, mm -hmm. Um, I think I think her her person will be even more um, imagined. You know, we can really understand really what's going to put the pieces together because I think we're still kind of pulling pieces out here and there, and actually to put it all together, I think is the ultimate goal. So we really have a clear idea of her full journey. Um, mm -hmm. I know that her children seem to um, really really honor her. The fact that her name is still in existence in our generation right. now means that she was pretty important mm -hmm. um and people had a lot of pride in that name of being a south gate you know or being yes. associated with the south gates and the heirs um but um i'm really just looking forward to finally like having enough pieces that we can really like paint an accurate picture of her life um sure. you know yeah for me i've always been curious why did they take the south gate name uh because alan was H hobday and he even shows up in records as Hobday. Um, Constant Griffin left a will and he named Charity in it and he referred to her as Charity Hobday. Right. So at some point they took the name Southgate. Any idea of why they chose that? We have a Southgate, Kentucky in Campbell County. Absolutely. <laughs> Would that be uh, well, a connection? I, I think that is the connection. Um, okay. I, I assume that, because uh, I know at one point Richard Southgate, which I think was that sort of, um, you know, patriarch at the time who was from New York State and had moved to uh, Newport um, and was, I don't think he had, uh, I think, I know he had house servants and the house servants were an actual family. It's like a father, mother and their children. Um, and so I believe that Alan was part of that family and that he was, um, uh, uh, the word you used earlier, hired out into just a little south of, of Newport and was in the home of John Hobday and just sort of, and I assume that he may have been um, uh, uh, hired out as a young person, like probably like a boy or a, a young man and just sort of stayed in the Hobday family's home and then had that name, but, but, but just went back to the, the Southgate name when he became a free person. That's what I imagine to identify with his own family. Um, right. And that would make some right. sense. Mm -hmm. That would make sense. Right. The other possibility, Fran, is that Alan may have been a child of Richard Southgate and or some of his sons or brothers. Okay. And so the changing and so removing him out of Newport, because this happened more often than not, 
a child born of a white man and enslaved woman, particularly if the family was not good on that, and most of the time they were not, they mm -hmm. removed the child so you didn't have to see <laughs> what happened. Right. And then, right, and so that also could make sense that he went mm -hmm. back to Southgate because that actually is indeed his name, um, biologically wise, you know? Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. So Alan Southgate just kind of drops off before the 1860 census. Do we know for certain that he died at that time? Yeah, because I haven't found him anywhere. Um, Nowhere. Okay. And yeah, I haven't found him anywhere, no. Um, and everyone else seems to track pretty, you know, um, accurately yes. and the children and the grandchildren, they seem to stay very close to each other. Mm -hmm. um, and they're very clear, like in death records or whatnot, that they mentioned Alan Southgate as their father um so yeah um, i'm sure he probably died just, probably smallpox or cholera or just the influenza you know you never know right yeah. All kinds or of old species. age like what 55 was old back then right yes it was uh -huh. right it sure was right yeah well keith it's been so great to talk to you today uh oh like always full of good stuff whenever whenever yeah. i hear you <laughs> yeah. always yeah, i appreciate that i appreciate that <laughs> We so appreciate you being here. Um, and uh, for everyone watching, this is on our YouTube channel and it will stay there uh, indefinitely. Thank you very much for joining us today. All right, thank you.